most of my work with rice has been in Bangladesh. So it's going to be a little, the data that I present will mostly be coming from work that we've been done in Bangladesh. But what I'm really trying to do here is to present an overview of what we know about arsenic in rice and whether or not this really is an issue. Back in 2007, a scientist from Aberdeen University in Scotland basically challenged the safety of U.S. rice uh, and this caught the public's attention, as you could imagine, uh, and the U.S. rice industry was pretty defensive about this. They still are. Uh, but anyway, this is really where arsenic in rice came to the attention of the general public, I would say. In, in 2012, Consumer Reports published a study they did on arsenic in rice. They've had a follow-up study uh, in 2014. Both of these studies are pretty good studies. There's some flaws, but, but if you look at the, the overall picture they present, it's probably a reasonable one. They did title this study Arsenic in Food, but basically it was arsenic in rice, so there was little uh, misdirection there. Uh, so I'm going to talk today really about three areas, health impacts and standards for arsenic in rice, and water as well, arsenic uptake and, uh, in rice uh, and toxicity to rice, so a little bit of physiology. I'm going, it's going to be pretty superficial given the time constraints. And then strategies to reduce arsenic in rice by crop management and, and then by processing and cooking. When I present data, um, I'm going to try and talk in parts per billion PPB uh, which is equivalent to micrograms per kilogram, or parts per million uh, ppm, which is equivalent to milligrams per kilogram. The figures sort of switch back and forth between these because some of them I've just copied from uh, publications, and that was what the authors used. So if you write anything down, if you're not sure about these units, uh, write them down now. <coughs> Okay, well, you're all familiar with arsenic as a, as a lethal toxin, so as an acute toxin. It is also a chronic toxin, and it has m multiple effects that are documented with varying degrees of certainty, I would say. What is most certain is its effect as a carcinogen, on, uh, particularly on lung uh, cancer and for uh, cancer of the urinary tract. It's also, though, been linked to circulatory, circulatory problems, heart disease, diabetes, and even reduced physical and mental uh, development, although I've looked at all those papers and they're not so strong, in my opinion. In general, our arsenic exposure comes from a combination of water and food. Uh, and th we have standards for arsenic in water, not so much for arsenic in food. So arsenic in water is basically inorganic arsenic. Often it's arsenate, but it can also be arsenide or a mixture of the two, depending on the water source. The WHO and the US has a drinking water standard of 10 parts per billion, uh, and that is set for a consumption of two liters of water per day. And so if you take two liters of water, multiply it by 10, parts per billion, that allows a daily intake of 20 micrograms of inorganic arsenic. Also, uh, the U.S. has the same standard for arsenic in apple juice, um, which does have arsenic in it. Um, in general, uh, organic arsenic species, which are found in foods as well as the inorganic species, are much, much less toxic. And uh, seafood, for example, has the highest concentration of arsenic you'll find in a food at parts per million level, maybe as high as 10 parts per million, uh, which would be a disaster if it was in rice. But basically, in seafood, uh, both fish and things like shrimp, etc., it's present as 
arsenocholine and or arsenobetaine, both of which are considered essentially non-toxic. So basically, when regulators set standards, they're considering only inorganic arsenic content because that's what's critical from a toxicity perspective. Now, is our drinking water standard of 10 parts per billion equivalent to no cancer risk? And for health, I'm just going to concentrate on uh, lung cancer. Bladder cancer or urinary tract would have about the same incidence of lung cancer a as a, an example of a health effect. Well, the answer is the 10 parts per billion standard is not associated with zero risk of increased cancer. It's associated with the risk of 340 cases per million people for on a lifetime basis. If you go down to one part per billion, it drops down to 30 uh, per, per million cases. Uh, that's really not different than zero, uh, given the uncertainty in the models. So bear in mind that the 10 PPB standard is not absolutely safe. However, when you think about risk, you really have to put it in perspective. And, you know, people generally don't do this, which is a problem. Uh, so here's a few risks that we have in our life. Obviously, annual road fatalities at 100 per year, you multiply that out at a lifetime, it's going to be much higher than 340 that we get from 10 ppb uh, of arsenic in drinking water. And, you know, I mean, I've just picked a few. Some are, are uh, obviously much less risk. Some are higher. The one in the bottom is probably maybe the worst one. <laughs> but w as far as food is concerned, anyway. So not everybody has a 10 part per billion standard for arsenic in drinking water. Many countries in the developing world have a 50 part per billion. Bangladesh is one of those. So. Um, here's how going from 10 to 50 parts per billion increases the cancer risk for a Bangladeshi. So what you can see is that uh, basically I've put here that, that it's a six-fold uh, increase over the World Health Standard of 10 parts per billion. Also, people don't, you, I mean most people drink more than two liters of liquid a day. In the U.S., it's, it's around two and a half. In Bangladesh, it's closer to four in, in more tropical environments. So basically, the two liters in many cases is clearly an underestimate of uh, consumption. And it's not just water, it's coffee, which is obviously has water in it, tea, it's coke, et cetera, et cetera, beer, wine, and so on. Uh, but anyway, going to 50 parts per billion standard has a big in impact on uh, lung cancer incidence. Now, arsenic in rice is a mixture of inorganic and organic forms. The organic form is principally dimethyl arsenic acid, DMA, and uh, basically DMA, well, I, the, the Arsenic in rice is between 20 and 100 percent inorganic, so it, and it tends towards mostly inorganic. Uh, and also, although in varying quantities, from as low as five parts per billion to a thousand parts per billion, and even higher. So clearly, if we're thinking about the health impact of arsenic in rice. Uh, we have to know about the speciation of arsenic in rice and the inorganic arsenic level in particular. We have to know about the bioavailability of arsenic in rice, and this is not well studied. There are some, and most of the studies are pretty flawed, uh, but generally it seems to be high, you know, maybe as high as 90% even. But that's not really firm at the moment. And then, of course, the consumption of rice varies. So in the USA, uh, on average, we consume 29 grams of rice per day. This is not just rice as rice grain. It's rice krispies. Uh, it's, it's rice in, uh, in energy bars, 
uh, a whole bunch of uh, products have rice in them. So, so combining all of those, the average intake is 29 grams per day. An average Bangladeshi consumes 470 grams per day, the average adult. Now, of course, there's going to be ranges. Uh, so some people, in terms of in the USA, probably consume hardly any rice. Some people will, if you're a Bangladeshi in, in, or another South Asian in um, the US, you probably eat uh, quite a lot of rice, maybe less than you would if you were in your home country. And people in South Asia have been reported up to eating 700 grams of rice a day. You know, 470 grams is somewhere between like six to eight cups of cooked rice a day, to give you a, a sense. Now, what about standards for arsenic in rice? Last year, the United, State, uh, the United Nations uh, Codex Alimentarius Commission set a maximum limit for inorganic arsenic in white rice, which is what most people eat, uh, at 200 parts per billion. Now, this is 20 times the standard for inorganic arsenic in water. So at first sight, that seems to be very high. Uh, China also has a standard for inorganic arsenic in rice of 150 uh, parts per billion. So it's somewhat similar to the codex standard. So why is the codex standard so high? Well, let's take a look at that. But before we do, let's look at the speciation of arsenic in rice grain. Now, this determining the speciation is not straightforward. Only in the last year or so really do we have methods that look like they're really reliable. They're also very expensive and very high tech. Uh, so here's one study by Huang et al. Uh, they developed uh, some of the extraction methodologies, methodologies that seem to be very good at preserving species recently. So they, in, this, in this study, they had 121 total samples. Uh, they represented 12 different types of rice. That was Japonica indica. It was also long grain, short grain. It was also red, black, white, etc. Uh, from five, they were, they were purchased uh, in five different countries. So it's a pretty broad uh, representative uh, group of rice. And this is their results for the speciation um, in terms of concentration data. So if you're not familiar with these box and whisker plots, the lower whisker represents the fifth percentile, the upper whisker represents the 95th percentile in the values, and the box itself represents between the 25th and 75th percentiles. And then this little box here and the dashed line, I think the box is the mean and the dashed line is the median. You can see the mean and the median in these samples are pretty close. So it gives you an idea about the distribution of arsenic and the frequency of different levels. Uh, so what you can see is that uh, arsenite is the predominant species. There's a small amount of arsenate in most rices, uh, but not all. And it really, in general, is pretty small. Uh, there is much more DMA than arsenate. Uh, and the DMA, uh, though, is less than the arsenite. And then uh, monomethyl arsenic acid uh, is found in trace levels. And this is, um, uh, there's also in addition to, 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 to the species here, there's one or two others at very, very low levels that they don't know what they are yet. So, in, so generally, you can see that arsenic seems to be do in rice or is, is dominated by in arsenite or inorganic. 90% uh, of the inorganic on average was arsenite. Some rice, however, is dominated by DMA and has much more DMA than arsenite. Trace levels of MMA. And in thinking about this, we can simplify it to just combining the two inorganic species into inorganic AS and uh, to DMA. Now, I want to just show you about well, how do we get DMA in rice. Well, 
ignore this stuff over here. This is uh, some of the microbial transformations of arsenic. Uh, so if we start with arsenate, this is its formula here, uh, microbes can uh, uh, methylate this by a process that involves reduction to the AS3 form, then a methylation of that AS3 forms, in this case to monomethyl arsenic acid, which is now in the AS5 uh, or oxidized form. That is, can be reduced again to the AS3, methylated again to di dimethyl arsenic acid, reduced again, methylated again to trimethyl arsine oxide. Um, and so basically, uh, a whole range of organisms can do this. Microbes, uh, both anaerobic, um, aerobic, uh, uh, algae can do this. Yes, Chris? It's been a while since I've had chemistry, but could you draw a line between inorganic and organic, uh, just so that uh, I can understand this a little better? Well, this is inorganic, this is inorganic, anything with a like a methyl group here or things with carbon structures are, is organic, okay? Um, so basically, um, in soil, microbes are methylating arsenic to, to varying extents. Methylation tends to be much higher when soils are continuously flooded, when it's anaerobic, um, than it is aerobically. Um, but you also have to have uh, good oxygen, biological oxygen demand for that to, to happen. And in general, it looks like the source of these methylated arsenic species in rice is uh, from the soil, uptake from the soil. Now, human metabolism of inorganic arsenic in the liver is exactly the same to generate uh, these methylated species, and, and then arsenic is mostly excreted in the urine, and it's a mixture of, of DMA, usually 60 to 70 percent DMA, uh, maybe 20, 10 to 20 percent of MMA, and similar amounts of inorganic arsenic in, in urine. This is generally regarded as a detoxification process, okay? Toxicologists, however, are debating it still whether that's true or not. DMA is toxic to rice, <laughs> I should tell you that. <laughs> and MMA too. Now, let's come back to the Codex Commission and this 200 PPB standard. So here, I'm just showing, well, the Codex Commission is a good UN bureaucracy, okay? So it follows protocols that sometimes are, are hard to understand and hard to rationalize too. Um, so they, whenever the UN does stuff like this, they collect people from different countries and they collect <coughs> data from these people from their country. And then they use this in their deliberations and set various kind, come to various kinds of conclusions based on this. So I'm showing you rice that came from Japan and rice that came from the USA or data that came to the UN Commission. And what you can see uh, is plotted here is the total arsenic and the inorganic arsenic. And here is the one-to-one -one line. Now, for Japanese rice, you can see that most of the rice is very close to this one-to-one -one line, meaning that it's mostly, or almost all, inorganic arsenic in the rice. Okay? In contrast, in the USA, you can see that, oh, the rice is diverging greatly from this one-to-one -one line. So, the, so basically, uh, as we're going over here, we're getting more and more um, DMA in our rice, and, less than, and the inorganic arsenic fraction is not so high. And you can see here, it actually looks like it levels out at some fairly constant value around a little bit above a hundred uh, parts per billion or 0.1 uh, ppm. Um, the other thing to notice is the concentration value. So we're getting up to about 200 parts per billion. And, and of the countries that submitted the, uh, right, the data, Japan actually was the only one that had samples of inorganic uh, uh, 
or concentrations of inorganic arsenic in the rice that exceeded 200 parts per billion. Okay, so this is one clue as to why they selected the 200 parts per billion, because they, they wanted to protect health, they also wanted to protect trade. Okay, so 70% of the trade in rice is white rice, so they focused on white rice rather than brown rice. Uh, and um, they also wanted to reduce rice intake by humans. Um, and they felt that this standard achieved these goals. I disagree with that, and I'll show you why in a moment. Um, but anyway, notice this level of about 200 parts per billion. I mean, we've analyzed rices that have you know, 800 parts per billion inorganic arsenic in them, and so have other people. So this 200 uh, is, is not a fixed sort of value. This is how the rice from different countries looked. They had uh, rice samples mostly from Australia, China, Japan, Thailand, USA. They did have others, but I, in their reports they didn't present any data. So I took their f these figures and translated them into this. Um, so what I'm plotting here is the cumulative percent of the samples, and these are the sample numbers here, versus the percent of inorganic arsenic that is in the rice. This is, you may not be familiar with looking at this type of graph. So let's just look at the 50% level. So anything, these lines over to this side mean that there's more DMA than inorganic arsenic in the rice. Lines over this side mean there's more inorganic arsenic than DMA. So let's look at Australia. Okay, the 50% inorganic arsenic or equal amounts of inorganic arsenic and DMA, uh, you see 90% of the rice uh, on a cumulative basis then is uh, at this 50% level. That means Nine out of ten samples of rice from Australia have more DMA than inorganic arsenic. In contrast, when you look at Japan, whoa, all of the, all, none of, all of the rice has more inorganic arsenic than DMA. And then, so simply you're just uh, adding the quantities together in a cumulative basis to end up with 100% of the sample. So it tells, gives you an idea. So what you can see from this is these rice samples from different places are different in their distributions between inorganic arsenic and um, DMA. Australia and the US are more, you know, DMA. Thailand sort of, well, and then Japan and China are mostly inorganic and Thailand sort of in between. Now that's without reference to what the quantity is. Uh, you know, so it's for it's the quantities come close to zero to way up here. <clears throat> now, what did Jeffker uh, consider? So they, I mean, the Codex, they considered Another UN uh, report by uh, the Jeffka committee, I was actually on this committee, which um, looks at uh, contaminants in food. And uh, there was a, a recommended tolerable weekly intake of arsenic that uh, at this last meeting in 2010, uh, the Jeffka decided to eliminate because it was too risky based on new information. But they did come up with a benchmark dose for a half a percent increase in lung cancer rate. Okay, this is lifetime risk. And that, that concentration, they said, was about three micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. Typically people, uh, nutritionists, when they're doing this, and toxicologists work with 60 or 70 kilogram adults, which is not really representative of the U.S., but anyway. Uh, for, for a 60 kilogram adult, this would correspond to 180 micrograms of 
uh, inorganic arsenic per day. Now, then they said, okay, so that's, that's the, this benchmark dose. So they took, that does correspond to substantial cancer risk, however. Um, then they looked at 13 diets uh, from across the world uh, and uh, the maximum rice consumption that they came up with was 375 grams per day, obviously in South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and they said, okay, if we set our limit at 0.2 milligrams per kilogram or 200 parts per billion, this corresponds to an intake of 75 micrograms per day. Well, this is really less than this, so therefore we're fine. The problem with this is they ignored the fact that we have a drinking water standard that allows an intake of 20 micrograms a day. And we don't have that because we think that 75 micrograms a day is safe. We have it, and people actually want to reduce the standard from 10 to 3. I mean, a lot of people have talked about that. New Jersey has a standard of 5 parts per billion. So, I think the problem here is that there's different, they not, there's different perceptions of risk. You know, a 0.5, if you had a 1% incidence of a disease in your population, that would be a public health emergency, I believe. So, you know, a half a percent is not that different, so why somehow do we suddenly feel that that might be acceptable? But risk is something that you all have to think about and decide for yourself. And another thing Codex didn't really look at is who eats rice and how much do they eat and where are they? So I did that. It's not that easy actually as it turns out. So um, I actually uh, looked at data. There's 14 countries here that represent a total population of 3.4 billion people so that's, right now we have uh, 7 billion people, so this is close to half the world's population. You may not be able to see this very well, but this is the average daily intake of white rice. So Bangladesh, 474, Bhutan, 471, Cambodia, 438. China and India are big populations, 2 billion, right? Well, for China, in India, I tried to disaggregate the data a lot, and for India, I did find detailed data uh, for rice consumption by state, by men, by, by male and female, by rural and urban, so a pretty detailed data set. For China, I could not find as much information, uh, but I did discover that the average intake for the rice consuming population, which is 66% of the total population, the average rice consumption then is 320 grams per capita per day. So then when you plot uh, the uh, population that um, consumes more than 200 grams of rice per day, it's 2 billion. If you go up to, to the consuming more than 450 grams per capita per day, it's around 170 million people. So this is a lot of people. So, you know, it may be fine to have a standard of 200 ppb in your rice for the person who consumes the average U.S. diet, but it's not fine for the average Asian who consumes much more rice. So, actually, this is a figure I put together for Bangladesh, and I just modified it slightly and so it really is more for the big consumers of rice. So now, I'm, I'm here, so let's just look at water at 50 parts per billion, the Bangladesh standard. Remember the risk of lung cancer for 50 versus 10 is increased sixfold, okay? If you consume two liters and four liters, this is where you come out on this, on this, uh, on the graph. Uh, then if you add rice to this, uh, I added rice at two levels, 250 and 500, because the numbers were nice and round. And I calculated the average, well, I chose these levels of, of arsenic in rice to represent the, 
from a national survey of rice in Bangladesh, we got an average of 200 parts per billion, and 80% inorganic is the, is the average amount for Bangladesh. For a survey in, in counties where there's arsenic contamination, we got 400 uh, PPB average in rice. So basically, and again, 80%. So basically, the, that's how I got the 160 and 320. These numbers are not too bad, considering the Kodaks wants to set the value at 200. But then this would shift the risk to this point for two liters of uh, water at 50 parts per billion, 250 grams of rice at 160 parts per billion, the low level, and then here at the higher level and four liters of water, you can see how the risks shift. So for Bangladesh and other high rice consumers, uh, the consumption of rice is going to increase your risk between one and a half and two times, depending on how much you eat. And that's relative to a 50 part per billion per billion water standard. This is where the risk is for the two and four liters for the 10 parts per billion. So, in the, so for us here in the US, if we consume, say, one cup of cooked rice per day, give you a sort of feeling for, how, for quantities, and if that contained 100 parts per billion, then uh, that's going to increase the lung cancer risk from 340 to 520. So that gives you uh, a sort of a, a reference point, I think. Now, FDA has looked at uh, speciation of arsenic in U.S. Uh, rice and, well, well, not just U.S. rice, rice from other countries. So I, I put together the data for white rice uh, in, the, in the United States, and this is by a state of production and by rice type to some degree as well. So. The southern states, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, and the west, California, 80% uh, of our rice is grown in the south, 20% in California, 50% in Arkansas, roughly. Um, and uh, I should say that in the southern states, the rice that is grown is a lot, mostly long and medium grain, whereas in California, it's mostly medium and short grain. So there are some uh, d uh, differences there in types of rice. Um, and then these numbers here are the numbers of samples from uh, each state. Um, so if we look at inorganic arsenic, this, this red bar here, as you go across, you can see that it's pretty constant in the southern states at a little less than 100 parts per billion. And you get to California, it drops. Uh, and it drops a bit more here for the medium than the short uh, grain rices. These are rices where we didn't know where they came from, and this is parboiled rice out here from Arkansas. So the U.S. rice clearly, in general, is containing less than 100 ppb inorganic arsenic with little variation. You know, I mean, the standard deviation is, is, is pretty low. Um, when you look at the total arsenic, oh, it's quite a lot higher than that, especially in the southern states, and that is because of dimethyl arsenic acid being in the rice, and that is particularly the case in Texas. And um, in the U.S., we used to use arsenic pesticides on cotton, and uh, a lot of, we had 25 million acres of cotton in the south at one time. And some of that cotton land is now growing rice. And they put huge amounts of chemicals. I mean, you know, the US has had huge amounts of arsenic spread around in various places. The closest contaminated site in Ithaca, New York, is Cornell's Orchard across the road here. Uh, the arsenic, <laughs> the background soil arsenic is, a, is around five to seven milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. In the Cornell Orchard, we scraped off the top six inches from an area, mixed it well, and we got 60 in that. So a lot. And sometimes the rates of application of lead arsenic this was in orchards was as high as 80 pounds per acre per year of arsenic. You know, that's a lot of arsenic. And they've done this since, you know, for, for up through the 50s anyway, 
uh, for a long period of time. Now, this is looking at the arsenic intake from uh, food and water in the United States. Now, the, f uh, the first thing you see is maybe a bit of a surprise. We take more arsenic in from food than we do from water. Yet we have stand this is inorganic arsenic, and this yet our standards are for water and not for food. Okay? The other thing that you notice about this is that uh, it, the intake from food is, is particularly uh, important for infants uh, less than five years old. However, uh, the total intake um, of arsenic is, is not very high. Uh, the mean for a 12-year-old uh, upwards uh, based on 70 kilogram weight uh, would be 4 micrograms. That's the, that would be the mean for, an, for a, from 12 years, this part of the curve here. The 95th percentile for that would be 14, still less than our water intake. So although we're taking more arsenic from food than water, we're overall not taking uh, very much arsenic. But if you look at where does arsenic come from in food, number one, vegetables. This is the U.S. diet, okay? Number two, fruits and juices. Number three is rice. So number two is fruits and juices. Three is rice. Four is others, but uh, this is beer and wine. So, you know, we're talking vegetables, fruits and juices, beer and wine. What could be more important to people in the United States than these <laughs> commodities, right? So if we're going to regulate rice, why, arsenic and rice, why wouldn't we regulate arsenic and all these other products? Now, this has been known for a very long time. EPA has been working on this for more than 20 years. And basically, I think, you know, the regulators have sort of created a problem for themselves that's not easy to solve. So let me switch and talk about arsenic in rice and what we know about it. Well, it, arsenic in rice is very high relative to other cereals because in, rice is mostly grown in flooded soil. And in, this, in a flooded soil, uh, iron hydroxides, I'm uh, just using this little term loosely, uh, are reduced to release ferrous iron. Well, this releases also phosphate and arsenate, which would be sorbed in these oxides. This is the main sink for phosphate and arsenate in uh, soils. The main uh, absorption site is on ferric hydro hydroxides. So, when we flood the soil, then we release ferrous iron and we release phosphate and we also release arsenic. So this is why uh, uh, arsenic ends up being high in rice and not in wheat. Okay? Now, in, when you grow rice or any, any uh, wetland plant in soil, it has to have oxygen in the roots. So it has an orenchyma structure or a, hole, a holy structure in its stem to allow oxygen to diffuse down through the, stem, the leaf, the stem, and into the, into the root. And then oxygen also diffuses out of the root into the soil uh, where it oxidizes, reoxidizes a small portion of the soil surrounding the roots, the, the zone we call the rhizosphere. And you get ferric hydroxide, this orange color, precipitating on the surface of the roots. Now, wetland plants do this. I mean, people mainly think that you could have a lot of iron toxicity if wetland plants didn't do this. Uh, but also, if you re-precipitate your iron hydroxide, you will reabsorb some of this phosphate and arsenic onto the uh, uh, surface. So this provides some protection to arsenic uptake, but not much. So what do we know about uptake by plants? We know quite a lot, and I'm going to massacre this probably as far as the Geneticists would be concerned, but I apologize for that. But what we know is that inorganic arsenic-3 or arsenide and arsenate are taken up much more readily 
than our MMA and DMA, a much faster rate of uptake. Uh, arsenate uses the phosphate transport system and, and is competitive. So if you have a lot of phosphate, you depress arsenate uptake. If you have a lot of arsenate, you depress phosphate uptake. Um, arsenite is taken up by the silicate uh, uh, aquaporin, well, the systems that use the silic silicate transporters uh, and they go through aquaporin general channels uh, into the rice root. Now, phosphate and silicate, well, phosphate is important to all plants. So if you're going to mess with that, that's a bit of a problem. Silicate is very important to rice uh, also. So if you mess with that, that's going to be a problem. When, the, when ars inorganic arsenic gets into the plant, if it's arsenate, it gets reduced to arsenite. This happens in pretty much all the plants, as far as, we can, as far as we know. So there's reduction of arsenate to arsenite. Uh, in the root, the arsenite can complex with thiol groups on, on peptides, and I'm just using glutathione as an example here, GSH then is the abbreviation for that, and form a, a complex that can be stored, moved into and stored in vacuoles within cells. So that removes it from the transport system within the plant. Or arsenite is transported out of cells using another silica transporter. Um, and that transport could take it out of the plant, <laughs> or it could take it into the, into the xylem uh, and then into the upper part of the plant. Uh, the intake of arsenite is not competitive with silicate uh, into the root, but the movement out of cells within roots is competitive with silica. So if you have high silica, you could suppress the movement of arsenic in the plant. As it moves up the plant as arsenite, it basically uh, meets nodes, obviously, and uh, these are points of restriction for upward movement. So as you go up the plant, the concentration drops. And, and also at each node, there's partitioning of arsenic between the stem and the leaf in those proportions, roughly. And also, there is the formation of these thiol complexes again and storage of them in vacuoles of different types of cells in the tops of plants. And um, also, we know that the movement of, although the uptake of DMA is much less than inorganic arsenic, its movement to grain is much, much greater than that of inorganic arsenic. And so, while we get quite a lot of arsenic in the plant, there's not a lot that gets to the grain of inorganic arsenic. Here's just a, an example of what you can do with some fancy modern instruments. This is looking at the phloem region of an of a internode of rice. And this, so uh, what you can see here are the sieve tubes where um, Elements are transported to the grain through these, and then there's com surrounding companion cells. This is a copper, and you can do all elements with this technique. Yeah, this is ca a carbon and nitrogen mapped, so you can see what's where. Then this is a map of arsenic. And what you can see is arsenic is very clearly in the vacuoles, so in the <coughs> central vacuole portion of the cells, um, of these companion tube cells surrounding the sieve tube elements. And it's associated with sulfur very strongly. And basically for arsen arsenite to get into the grain, it has to come through these companion cells into the sieve tube elements and then go up to the grain. So you can see that uh, the rice plant has mechanisms to immobilize and remove inorganic arsenic. If you look at the distribution of arsenic in rice, 3% in the grain um, for inorganic arsenic, roughly, uh, but half of the DMA that's in a rice plant is generally in the grain. This is sort of patched together from different data sets. I'm just going to show you some toxicity, but I don't want to talk about it. You can see that it doesn't look too good in the conventional patty in a raised bed here, which is more, less water. It's definitely much better. You can see that can have a significant impact on rice production. This is one of the main rice 
uh, varieties in Bangladesh grown in a farmer's, uh, in, on a farm across a, an arsenic gradient that was created by using irrigation water that contained arsenic. And you can see substantial yield reduction. And there's also varietal differences. So here's a variety, uh, Beard Iron 47, which, yeah, it actually looks like it likes arsenic. <laughs> it grows better with it than without it. And this other variety here, you can hardly see it, it produced <coughs> in this pot study produced uh, no grain at all. In, in, in the field, uh, the toxicity expression is not as great because the arsenic is mostly concentrated in the surface soil and roots can get deeper. But you see that there are uh, different varieties performed differently in the field. Uh, some are, there's no effect until you reach a sort of threshold concentration. Other, there's a linear decline from 10 parts per million upwards. Others, it goes down steeply, then it levels off. So clearly there's, there's varietal differences here. So then how, do, how can we reduce arsenic um, in rice? Well, three ways. Water management, make it more aerobic. There's various things listed here. I'll show you something about them. Varietal selection for varieties that take up less arsenic. And silica addition. This does work, but the rates at which it works seem to be way too high to be practical in a, uh, in a field setting. Something like 30 tons per hectare of silica gel which is impossible. So let's look at the, the water. So in, in water management, um, we've worked a lot with raised beds. We like these because you can get higher rice yield with less water, 40% less water, and two-thirds the number of plants. Um, Erie has promoted an alternate wetting and drying system, which is really flooding to 10 centimeters, draining, letting the water drain to uh, a depth of 15 centimeters below the soil surface, then flooding and going through that cycle over and over again. Um, so we compared the AWD and the raised beds versus conventional. For arsenic in rice grain, you can see that both the AWD and the raised beds reduce the uh, arsenic relative to the conventionally flooded uh, treatment. These are still high levels of arsenic, however, in the grain. And you can see that there is a good impact in terms of ameliorating toxicity. This is that very sensitive variety, flooded. This is it um, in the raised bed. Here is uh, the, one of the, the major winter season variety uh, on the flooded condition and in the raised bed. Here we get, which is not as sensitive as this one, we see we can actually uh, completely overcome the toxicity at this high arsenic level. But there's a problem with all of this from the perspective of arsenic in the rice. So this is six varieties grown across an arsenic gradient um, by in both conventional flooded conditions and on a raised bed. And I put all the data together and, and what you can see is it's, this is then the, the, plotting the straw arsenic concentration versus the grain arsenic concentration. And you can clearly see that the beds have lower arsenic than the, the conventional, but not a huge amount. We're going from about 0.4 to about 0.2. So a twofold decrease in uh, total arsenic concentration in the grain, but we've got almost a tenfold decrease in the arsenic in the straw. So one part per million in the straw is pretty low. To get less than one part per million, which is required obviously to get arsenic down in the, in the grain down here, um, requires a really aerobic system, okay? So here's one. A sprinkler irrigation uh, for aerobic rice production in Italy. Um, this was work done in Sardinia with a wide range of genotypes uh, representing mostly Japonica in that climate, but some indica. You can see the sprinkler irrigation. You can, they work very hard with this system to not reduce rice yield. Okay, that was a big uh, challenge. And here you can see at maturity. Uh, the grain in the average uh, grain concentration in the flooded uh, 
in grain from the flooded treatment was 163 parts per billion. From the sprinkler, it was three parts per billion. Okay? So at that level, it doesn't matter what it is in terms of form. And this is what it, their, their data look like. Point out the scale here for the flood, it is from zero to 300. The scale for the sprinkler is from, 100, is from zero to 18. So very much lower. You can see the variability they got. Uh, and, and so pretty good, pretty impressive. The thing about the water management is it works with all rice varieties. OK, SRI rice. Uh, here's an SRI rice from Madagascar, sold by Lotus Foods. OK, it's Madagascar pink. Uh, you can see the pink color. Um, this rice, ha this actual sample has five parts per billion arsenic. So it was clearly grown in an aerobic environment. Okay? Here's another rice. This is an arboreal rice grown in New Jersey, of all places, near Princeton. There's a picture of it uh, at Blue Moon Acres Farm an organic farm, um, and actually the, the farmer Jim Lyons grew five varieties, uh, just showing one there. There was their uh, levels of inorganic arsenic, uh, for, uh, pretty low, uh, and also the level of cadmium, which was pretty low. Why are we interested in cadmium? Because there's a trade-off with water management. And that trade-off is that when we come to arsenic, um, these treatments are getting progressively more aerobic. Don't really worry about the treatments. But uh, for arsenic, as we get more aerobic, we lower the, the content in the grain. These are two different varieties. For cadmium, what we find is that as we get to more aerobic uh, conditions, um, going in this direction now then, the concentration increases dramatically. Uh, and this is a, not a, it's a slightly contaminated soil by Chinese standards. Maury can tell you more about that. Uh, but the Chinese have a standard of 0.2 uh, ppm for cadmium in rice grain. So you can see that this is potentially a problem in China Cadmium pollution is, is huge. 10% of the rice in China is considered to be above this, this level here in terms of cadmium. And they were talking about banning rice production in Hunan province, which is the, it's, it's the highest rice quantity produced of the whole country. So, you know, that would be huge in terms of impacts on the international market for rice. So basically, this is an issue. It's not really, I don't really believe it's an issue for us in the United States. Uh, some varietal differences. We looked at this with Bangladesh rice varieties. All of the rice varieties that the Bangladesh Rice Research Institute uh, produced. Um, and there's two different seasons, uh, two different, so very different types of rice. I plotted just rice that varied by more than 10% from the mean here, and more than 20% the mean here. You can see that some varieties have higher levels than the mean, some have lower levels than the mean. Well, I put out just some notable things here quickly. Okay, this rice variety here um, is a salt tolerant variety. It is by far, it has a low level of arsenic in it relative to the uh, the mean, the mean value. It's also the one that is the most tolerant of arsenic when it comes to toxicity. These two rice varieties here, these are new drought resistant varieties. And they are really bad. You know, so, and, and, and so basically breeders need to be thinking about, well, they need to think about a lot of things, obviously, but this is one thing to add <laughs> to that list. <laughs> Now, you can reduce arsenic in grain by processing, so milling. 
How much is, is removed by milling to different levels? 5, 10, 15 percent mass removal? Okay, it's 15, 30, and 45 percent with Bangladesh rice varieties. Uh, does arsenic uh, removal vary with the level of arsenic in the brown rice? The answer is no. So we determined this with five varieties grown at two sites that gave us high and low grain arsenic levels. So here's data from one variety, the high arsenic site, the low arsenic site, the mass loss, and the grain arsenic. You can see um, obviously different arsenic levels to begin with and of course different, rem different amounts removed, but linear relationships. We're a bit surprised by that. When you put all the data together for all varieties at the different levels, again, you get linear relationships that let us come up with the 15, the 30, and the 45 percent values. Does arsenic removal vary with variety? The answer is no. So this is uh, all the Bangladesh rice, for berry rice varieties grown um, at different locations in the two different seasons and you can see we've got a linear relationship between brown rice and white rice milling now to 10 percent mass loss which is the standard. So that's the so getting white rice is going to have at least 30 percent less arsenic in it than um, brown rice. Now you can also reduce rice in, in grain by cooking in excess water and uh, basically, that would be a combination of washing till, till the wash water is clear, that may be five to six times, and then cooking in a volume of water that is five to six times the volume of the rice. And then after when it's, this is not so easy actually, <laughs> but basically then you have to discard the excess water. That combination though can reduce the arsenic content of the rice up to 50% provided you have no arsenic in the water that you're cooking with. If you do have arsenic in the water that you're cooking with, like you would possibly in Bangladesh and other South Asian countries, you can, get into re you can make it worse. So here's a high uh, arsenic rice here, and you cook in water with uh, no arsenic, and you can see it drops from something like you know, so 350 parts per billion down to less than 100. But then as you get arsenic in the cooking water, it goes back up and there's a critical cutover point here that's roughly half the concentration of arsenic that's in the rice, of course you won't know that, um, that you then see you get more arsenic in the cooked rice if you use this method of cooking. So be careful if you're doing this. And there are, there, there is, uh, there are wells in the U.S. that are contaminated with arsenic too. You can also achieve this by washing and then soaking for eight hours, which is a little, e which is easier to do. And I did this here, and with various rices, uh, with white rice, you could see the mean reduction was was again 50 percent, and the range was from 35 to 75 percent. Uncle Ben's parboiled was the 79 percent. However, when you do this with brown rice. It doesn't work nearly as well, and for most of these rice varieties, there's little difference. Okay? This soaking and also cooking in excess water removes nutrients as well. And it removes more nutrients from the white rice than it does the brown rice. Because so, so, you know, brown rice uh, is not so easy to get the arsenic out of. Anyway, I'll skip that. So let me just go to conclusions since I'm over here. So basically, I think it's fair to say that arsenic in rice does pose a significant health threat to people who consu consume rice as their staple uh, food. The codex limit, 200 ppb, in my opinion, is uh, way too high. Uh, another thing that regulators need to do is they need to consider the total intake of arsenic from diets, not just let's set a standard for water and let's set a standard for rice separately and not consider the other. Uh, this is not so easy to do, obviously. There are, though, many options to exist, uh, many options to reduce inorganic arsenic in rice, either crop management, varietal selection, 
and rice processing and cooking. Now, I didn't talk about this, but if you want low arsenic rice, go buy aromatic white rice, basmati, from India or Pakistan or California. And that generally be around 50 parts per billion. Okay? Uh, and if you want more information about this, I would read the consumer reports. They're available online. And uh, you can go to the last one. It's pretty reasonable in general. Well, sorry to go over, and thank you. John, I think you really captured the attention. The audience is still <laughs> here, except even a little over time. But I would like to, uh, uh, people would like to stay. Please, uh, uh, let's uh, continue the discussion. I know um, some have to leave, but uh, please feel free to um, yeah. ask a question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you expressed a bit of skepticism about the toxicity of inorganic arsenic right at the beginning of your talk. And, um, but did you, do you have the same feeling about the toxicity of the organic arsenic? And also the, the organic arsenic toxicity that you referred to at the beginning was arsenobetaine and right, arsenocholine. Right. Yeah, but they don't seem to be the predominant forms no, of arsenic no. in your rice. In, in so rice, how right, right. How do we right. process that? No, I think, the, you know, the, uh, the toxicity of inorganic arsenic is not questioned. The toxicity of organic arsenic of certain forms is questioned. So arsenobetaine and arsenocholine, no, they're not toxic. So don't worry about seafood. Um, but DMA, uh, which is in rice then, you know, if you grow rice in DMA solution, it's toxic to rice. So, you know, you know that, that it is toxic to the plant. So if it's toxic to the plant, it's probably toxic to humans too. But the toxicologists are debating this strongly. What the current situation is, I'm not exactly sure, but when I last looked uh, two or three years ago, um, arsenic three species are quite toxic, uh, more so than arsenic five. Some of the organic arsenic three species are not stable, so you can't really even measure them properly. So that suggests that, you know, they don't exist in, in, in most uh, organisms, perhaps. Um, but there is debate about this, and there's, you know, DMA is toxic, DMA3 is toxic to single cells in studies. Um, but then, yeah. But, but then basically I think, you know, you, you, you have to put an organism together. You can't just work on single cells. So, uh, so it's a bit of an open question, but, you know, all the toxicologists at that Jeffco meeting I went to um, in Rome, those guys didn't, you know, they didn't, care about the organic arsenic at all. They were the experts, and we, there were people from FDA there as, and from all over the world. So, you know, I just go along with that. <laughs> yes, Peter. So I, I think that there's reasonable epidemiological studies linking arsenic in water to cancer and other health effects. Is there any evidence for <laughs> arsenic in food, epi studies? Like no, there aren't any. And th this is, uh, you know, this is why people are really concerned about what is the bioavailability of inorganic arsenic in rice. Does, can, I mean, I assumed 100% in those calculations I did simply because that's the worst case scenario. Um, I would say that the extractant that people are using for arsenic from uh, rice is dilute nitric acid. Well, our stomach is acid, so, you know, it's not hot <laughs> or not as hot as 100 degrees, which people use or close to that. So, but, you know, and, and people have done studies with uh, pigs, which are a good model, but unfortunately they got their high inorganic arsenic by uh, 
cooking a, an Australian rice, which was all DMA, they cooked it um, in high arsenic water and then, and then dried it and then fed it to the pigs. And they compared that with the high DMA rice, which they hadn't manipulated. And yet the DMA rice, you, you know, the, the DMA was pretty rapidly excreted and, and uh, basically um, the, there didn't seem to be any real problem. And, but in the inorganic arsenic, they came up, I think, with 90% bioavailability. But that's really a bioavailability of inorganic in, in, in rice that got there by cooking in arsenic contaminated water, not the natural inorganic arsenic in grain, which is complex with thiols predominantly. So, you know, that's debatable. Um, and even the inorganic arsenic uh, is debatable because the, the models are all based on Taiwanese population. And so, you know, there's genetic differences in people, there's diet differences, there's, there's <laughs> health status differences, all sorts of things. Yes, Olivia. You showed in the one slide that 50% of the arsenic is taken up by the roots. So are you aware of any studies at all where they're managing roots after harvest to reduce the amount of arsenic that stays in the soil so it doesn't build up? Uh, no. You know, in a place, a place like Bangladesh, sometimes the roots are even pulled up and used as, I mean, so animals will graze on them. But no, I mean, the, the arsenic, right, no, no, but what is an issue, more of an issue is the arsenic that's in the straw. And that concentration, you know, is, is an order of magnitude higher than you've got in the grain, at least. And, you know, straw is used as an animal feed. People eat animals, you know, and so you, and, you know, it's talk, going to be toxic to animals too. And it also gets in the manure. We looked at that. The concentration in the manure is about the same as the concentration in the straw, and then the manure may be used to cook as a fuel. So you burn it. So then, you know, maybe you're getting inhalation of us. There's all sorts of problems with uh, potential problems also with the food chain and use of the straw. Yeah, Elena. I have a question. So, a very interesting seminar and um, interesting data about arsenic cadmium relationship. So, I sort of wonder so, when you're introducing this aerobic environment, what happens with iron, as you mentioned, iron is getting oxidized. So, yes. the plant would experience iron deficiency in a way. So, that's why maybe rice didn't really grow that well, you mentioned as well. And then, uh, mm. in this mild iron deficiency, what would happen that basically cadmium will go through iron transporters. Yeah. So right. yeah, so that's why I kind of wonder whether it was also measuring iron because maybe by you know modifying this condition you are altering iron concentration in the seed in a way that is not beneficial because one of the goals of the breed is actually in, in, induce iron in it, you know increase iron. In right. No, I know. I mean, I, you know, I, that, it's really interesting topic. What I would say is that um, if you look at nitrogen nutrition as an example. And you look at upland rice, which is usually using nitrate as its main source, versus flooded rice, lowland rice, which uses ammonium. You know, they don't grow, each doesn't grow well with the other nitrogen source. So basically, um, you know, what I would do for the, if, if you're worried about iron deficiency in rice, I would look at the upland rice varieties, because they've had to deal with this. The lowland ones have had to deal more with toxicity. And so they've developed mechanisms, uh, defense mechanisms for that. But um, yeah, I, I mean this, you know, it, it, you should look at some of these. Uh, I didn't show the X-ray fluorescence imagery of that nice node, but manganese, iron were all in, they weren't in the, they were in the parenchyma cells. They weren't in the vascular bundles at all, okay? And uh, sulfur and uh, arsenic were, you know, in those companion cells. And uh, copper, uh, copper was on the, it was in the living tissue part of the cell. And uh, zinc was everywhere. <laughs> you know, so all the elements were different. And you, you look at that and it strikes you, whoa, it's a very powerful tool to see where these things are 
But then understanding the physiology and the biochemistry and the genetics of all of this is obviously <coughs> something for the future. <laughs> yeah, Chris. Uh, there have been some regional studies within China of disease incidences and so on. And Colin yeah. Campbell, I think, here yeah, published yeah, yeah. on that extensively yeah, yeah. written the book, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I wonder whether with this issue of arsenic, and the prevalence of particular diseases with arsenic, whether that has ever been pointed out, that in the areas where rice is grown, you get this kind of cancer much more than in the northern areas where they're eating sorghum or whatever they might be. Uh, do you know of any studies like that that might help with? No, I don't know of any. And no. you know, this is the, you know, the epidemiological studies are take a long time. You have lots of challenges with them, you know, you have to make lots of adjustments and there's always challenges to adjustments and so on. So it's not easy to, it's not easy to do that. I mean, I think, to be honest, if, if, you, if you can conclusively show that inorganic arsenic in rice has got a certain bioavailability, if it says 100%, if it's equal to water, then I'm sure it will behave the same as arsenic in water with the caveat that when you eat food, when you drink water, it may be influenced how you process things so, and how they interact. So basically, the, the, that's always an issue, you know. Uh, and, but, but in principle, I think you could argue that if it's as bioavailable as inorganic arsenic in water, then it's going to create the same problem. I mean, there are, I mean, you know, there's, there's there's, there are a lot of cancer cases uh, in Bangladesh. There's a lot of skin lesions and stuff associated with arsenic toxicity, and, you know, and some of that is associated with rice. Uh, as, as, of course, it's associated with water as well. Y yeah, let me go. You said that basmati rice has the lowest level. Yeah. By, by what factor? Well, it, it would say, on average, it would be like half the level that you've got in a U.S. white rice. So 50 parts per billion. And you said that washing white rice gets rid of roughly half the arsenic. Well, washing and cooking in excess water okay. one way, or washing and then soaking for eight hours. I did that because I figured I tried cooking in excess water, you know, and to get the consistency of the rice right is not that easy. Uh, and you need a huge pot, you know. <laughs> what, fra what fraction of the nutrients are you losing? When you're losing half the arsenic, are you also losing half the nutrients? Um, it varies with the nutrient. Um, you actually, if you cook in, in Cornell water, you'll increase calcium, you'll increase sodium, you'll decrease potassium by probably 80%, 80 to 90%. Phosphorus will decrease maybe 20%. Zinc doesn't change. Copper doesn't change. They did, so they, there's a whole issue of the water as well. <laughs> you know, what happens if the water is acidic? Uh, and what, what other elements does the water have in it that could be good or bad as far as the nutrients are concerned? Are you preferentially washing away the protein in the rice compared to the starch? No, I doubt it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think there'll be some, so, some soluble sugars that are coming out. I mean, initially when you wash it, you, so, sorry, you may be removing the dust that's on the surface from the milling, you know, and you get, you get a very milky color that gets progressively less. And I would assume, and, and, um, I would assume that you're extracting some um, low molecular weight type sugars or even polysaccharides and uh, you know that's a problem if you you try and extract inorganic arsenic from rice you get this very viscous solution that's really difficult to deal with you know and it's 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 one of that's one of the problems of in the speciation that you have all sorts of issues of getting it, getting it in a state that you can physically treat in the way that you want to yeah. Um, this is a comment, really, rather than a question. But in the knowledge that uh, the U.S. food industry in general has an arsenic 
problem. And given that FDA is a very politicized federal agency, I would be skeptical of any answer I got from FDA toxicologists about arsenic <laughs> issues in rice. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have your degree of confidence. Well, I have a lot of confidence in their analysis. You know, I mean, so basically you have to have, you have to check up on yourself all the time. And, you know, Consumer Reports doesn't do that. They have a lab do it, but you don't see the data that allows you to determine whether or not that's good. A lot of the, in the early data on speciation was based, it's based on extraction and then, you know, separation and, and measurement. Um, but the total arsenic values would be twice the sum of the species that you identified. You know, that was very common. Or in some cases it was 130 percent. The species were 130 percent of the total. Well, you know, so that tells you the, the methods are not that great. And the people who publish this stuff won't ever comment on that, ever. You know, paper after paper after paper, and, and, they, and they just won't acknowledge that the, you know, maybe there are some issues that we should think about here. And, but they always go, I mean, especially this group from Aberdeen, well, not the group, it was just the leader of the group, was, was trying to make, paint the worst possible picture. So we actually published a paper after we looked at U.S. rice and we said deliberately because of his bashing it all the time that U.S. rice was safer than rice from Europe. <laughs> I mean, you, would you ever say that in a scientific paper? <laughs> Did you get away with it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, just a quick, quick two questions. So um, you showed that DMA concentration, like in Australia, rice from what raised in Australia has mostly DMA as arsenic right. species. So I kind of wonder why it is. Is it due to growth condition? Is it due to microbiome? Maybe there is something in the soil which like, microbes are efficient yeah. in the I think a lot of it is probably to do with um, conti continuous flooding. So, you know, in Australia, uh, I mean, it's surface, it's all grown in New South Wales and it's surface irrigation. And you, you basically, rice production is very regulated. You can't grow, you can only grow a limited amount and, and th each year. And that's sort of based on the capacity to supply the water to keep it continuously flooded. In the southern United States, you know, people are also continuously flooding. The soils in, in Australia and, and uh, the U.S. have higher organic matter levels and probably higher available carbon levels than South Asian soils, which have been puddled to death. We don't puddle our soils here, basically. Except we start, in the south, they start growing rice like wheat. You direct seed it, and it's not, you know, after three weeks, you begin to flood it. So, so I think a lot is to do with the water management and the quantity of carbon that allows the soil to get really anaerobic. And I think the, the anaerobes methylate much more than aerobes in, in, in reality, yeah. But... <laughs> I have a question. I'm just I'm curious. So then you showed this data with different rice varieties, and you tried different concentration of arsenic, and then you mentioned that one of the rice yeah. just loved arsenic. So, so does it actually well, accumulate right? arsenic? No. It's excluded. No. It's excluded. No, no, no. Actually, that was interesting. We there's a group in in the in the southern U.S. USDA group who have worked. Well, USDA has worked on arsenic toxicity in rice for probably 40 years. <laughs> so, um, and uh, there's a Chinese scientist there who brought across a, a, a huge number of varieties from China and they evaluated them for their tolerance to monomethyl arsenic acid which was used um, on cotton and it's still used, well it, it's still used a bit actually, yeah. Uh, as a, as a herbicide, <laughs> believe it or not. And uh, uh, so they've focused on this. If you look, if you put that chemical in soil, it's, it is converted in organic arsenic. So, you know, I'm not sure. But anyway, they identified 10 rice varieties that were totally tolerant to arsenic. Uh, 
there's no U.S. variety that's totally tolerant. And the main varieties, you know, some years you might lose 50, 60 percent of your yield. So th this was a big deal for them. So we selected uh, maybe 10 varieties that represented different growth durations, different rice types and stuff, and different yield. Well, we picked the higher yield potential ones and evaluated them in Bangladesh. They were total disaster <laughs> yeah, compared to the to the, the beery varieties in general. And this Beery Darn 47 is by far the most tolerant rice that we have found. And the plant breeders are, you know, the problem with, I, with plant, we always have problems, agronomists always have problems with plant <laughs> breeders. But, you know, the, they don't look at enough environments. And they may say, well, we'll develop a, a variety for every environment. Well, come on, that maybe keeps your job, but it's not very good strategy. You want an environment variety that works in every environment, right? So basically, you know, you read papers, arsenic tolerant rice, in the, in, but they don't believe any of it unless they've looked at a wide range of environments. Uh, and most studies don't do that. Um, so, you know, we've looked with that variety in Bangladesh. If you bring it to the U.S., I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much, John.